What is up, everybody, and welcome to the DNVR Nuggets podcast. I'm your host, Adam Mattis, and I'm joined by two of my uh, three esteemed colleagues here at DNVR, the man with the wind in his hair, Harrison Wind. <laughs> uh, you know what's awesome about today's show is we subbed out D-Line, and this this was a big upgrade uh, going to our guests. Incredible today. trade. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible Debatable. trade. Uh, a, a big off-season acquisition, <laughs> even if it's only for a day. <laughs> Um, if only the Nuggets could have such a good offseason. Um, I'm also joined by Brendan Vogt, absent I yesterday, sh- back on the grind today. Yeah, I struggle with no Eric, though. He laughs at all my jokes. He That's true. He increases my value on the floor big time. It means our guest today is going to have to pick up the slack. Every joke we tell is hilarious, Mike, uh, and you just every now and then just throw in a good, like, you guys are the best. And then uh, I actually have a laugh track to my right that I was going to hit <laughs> for, for any uh, appropriate jokes. <laughs> it's too much effort, to be honest. Um, so the voice you are hearing is none other than the Denver Post's own Mike Singer, fresh back from the bubble. I guess he's been back for a little bit from the bubble. Um, but here to share some great stories about the bubble. Mike, how, how are you? Uh, how are you doing? I guess I could just start with that. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm great. Everything's good. Uh, it's it's kind of a funny time. You transition into uh, off season mode, which, as we all know, there really is no off season. Um, and it's funny because you kind of want to detach yourself, but at the same time, I, I was you know riveted by the NBA Finals. I, I watched yeah. every single second. I, I wanted to see uh, if. The Heat could stun the Lakers. I wanted to see how far they could push LeBron and AD. Like I care about that stuff. It's not like I, you know, I think everyone who's in this business, you love basketball. So just because the Nuggets lost in the Western Conference Finals, I can't entirely remove myself. I still am very curious how the season was going to play out. So uh, still just processing it, um, trying to unwind. Someone asked me recently, "Are you recovered? Are you exhausted?" Man, I'm I'm ready to go. Like wow, like I, I'm not that tired. Like it was <laughs> being in the bubble was almost rejuvenating, and yeah. I, I say that carefully because for months we were just watching Zoom calls and doing press conferences. Right, right. So I would go from my computer to the TV to my yeah. phone in, in like rotation, and I finally got to like see other humans. Um, you know, and you didn't necessarily, I mean, most people wore masks, but you didn't have to wear a mask at all times because everyone was getting tested every single day. So, uh, to answer your question in a, in a short wind, I'm doing well. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's funny that you brought that up though, because I did need to detox from this season and I felt like I took, I needed a good like 10 days or so. It wasn't until I think last week that I finally felt like, okay, I'm ready. And part of this was, I mean, it was every, every other day. And just, it was an, you know, I, I think we're probably a little bit more emotionally invested in this team. You're a little bit more objective and, you know, kind of look at it that way, but it was emotionally draining. I thought being down three, one, having all everything swing back. It was exciting. I I say that emotionally, not negatively. I mean, in all emotions, it was emotionally overwhelming. So I needed to detox. Did you guys, what do you think vote Harrison? How do you guys feel? I, I feel like I'm just now getting back into the swing of things. Uh, I'm with Mike. I didn't feel necessarily as drained at the end of this season as I did uh, at the end of last year, for example. Just like going to the arena, like being there yeah. until one, then coming home, uh, then like getting up there, like going back to the arena. Uh, that's just tiring in its own right. Uh, so I like always get sick after the season ends. Like <laughs> knock on wood, I haven't gotten sick yet. Just like a, a cold or something. I always get sick after the season ends. Um Maybe that's a sign that it wasn't as draining, but yeah, for me at least, I'm. Uh, I don't know if I'm ready to go right now, but give me like uh, three weeks and I could be ready to go. I think. Yeah. I, I could use a break. It, it was such a long. <laughs> it was a long season, and and for such a stretch of it, there was no season happening. But that's where all of our headspace had to remain, right? Couldn't really turn to draft coverage. It wasn't like right, we were taking right. vacations. We're, yeah, yeah. We don't even know when sports are coming back. So we just stayed in this space, you know, so for such a long time that um, there is something a little bit nice about being away from it. But the thing is, this the, I was you're watching the Lakers celebrate and you're thinking about how close the Nuggets were. You're like, all right, now let's do this again. I want to know. I want to know. Was this an aberration? Are they really that close? I'm ready to find out. So 
yeah. I needed a break, but that that disappears quickly. If, if I could just tell on myself, we're talking about we're being in a weird space. Were they done? Were they not? Uh, after March 11th, I think it was in April when the Denver Post were trying to figure out what our coverage looks like. And I did a series called Exit Interviews where I graded <laughs> the how the guy's season right. went. I talked to an anonymous scout. Like, we were all just trying things. We were trying to fill voids without knowing uh, when we were going to return. So I was trying whatever uh, could possibly come up with. And to the question of the emotional swing, I can tell you firsthand, people with the t- with the Nuggets who were in Orlando were emotionally exhausted from thinking they were going home in the first round, staving yeah. it off three times thinking they were going home against the Clippers, saving up. That's hard. They had yeah. to figure out what to do about packing. They, I think that they, most of them had packed, and then they were like, ah, eh, maybe we should slowly unpack. Like, there was a lot happening. Yeah, man. That's so, I, that really must have been the craziest experience for them. And I know you got a little bit close to it. I mean, we'll find out just how much insight you have into what their daily day, day-to-day was there, because um, I, I do think that's one of the interesting things. But first... Just tell us about arriving inside the bubble. I know that the you, you so you go after the Nuggets. It was announced, or you announced that you were going, or I think actually Mark Kisla announced that you were going right after the Nuggets beat the Clippers in Game Seven. Did you know beforehand that you would be go? I mean, like, were your bags packed? If this happens, I'm on the I'm out, I'm out the door. I so frankly, I had been banging the drum for several weeks. I, I'm yeah. leaning on people at the NBA. And I'm trying to plant seeds. Even before they got to the second round, I was like, hey, if they, you know, if this looks interesting, if they look, if they're starting to, you know, give the Clippers some trouble, maybe are we thinking about, uh, is there any chance you can change up the format and let, you know, me in? Basically, the NBA had two entry points and I was far beyond either Mm. one of them. Like I, they made it a huge exception. So I'm planting the seeds. I finally get the approval from the NBA. And then I need to go to the Denver Post and I need to say, hey, guys, can we make this work? Yeah, they eventually they they green light it. And I'm like holding my breath for two days. And then I'm still talking to people in the bubble and they're like, yeah, it's cool. Like, I'm thrilled that you're going to, you know, theoretically have a chance, but the Clippers are going to win game seven. So it doesn't matter. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny that they thought that because I think. If you said they're going to win game six, I would have said, okay. But going into game seven, I was like, no, Denver's going to smack them. No, like my guy, Sam Amick, he you know, he works for The Athletic now. I used to work with him at USA Today. He was like, like I'm really excited for you, but I'm not going to see you anytime soon. And I was like, uh, okay, dude, thanks for, uh, you know. And, and actually, Sam gets a little bit of credit. He was the one who pushed uh, people on the inside of the bubble to try to facilitate it. Yeah. And um, – So I know going into game seven, I'm like, if they win, I'm going to get to go. And I forget exactly what day it was. I think I think it was a Monday. It was either a Monday or a Tuesday. And whatever the day between game six and game seven was, I went and got bubble clothes, which I didn't know what bubble clothes were. I got some button downs that I was like, because people had told me the standard of dress that I would need to bring. (laughs) What was the standard of dress? Because you're inside there, a bubble, and nobody no, sees you. What's the point? Well, like I don't know. It's it's the fine. If but conceivably, yeah, if yeah. they go to the finals, you want to dress sure. nicely. But at the same time, everyone has dressed down. Everyone's taking the lead of the coaches. I'm talking sweatshirts and like borderline dress <laughs> pants, maybe jeans. The other thing that I do is I go to the grocery store because someone had told me that I need to stock up on snacks, which was not the case. But I ended up stocking up <laughs> on like a hell of a lot of beef jerky, Sour Patch Kids, Kind Bars. <laughs> And some like curing pods, <laughs> and that's what I stuffed into a suitcase and a book bag. Like the, the people at the at DIA must have thought I was nuts. I was like, don't ask. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny too because people's food opinions, like it, it, it's almost like there's no point in sharing them because everybody has a different perspective. If you tell me if I went there, I, I'm sure I would have been like, the food is fantastic. But I know there's other people that'd be like, it's the worst food on earth. No, the food was great. My point is that I didn't need to bring excess snacks because that's what I so mean. W- when we get into quarantine, like I-, I started my quarantine, whatever day it was, the day after they won Game Seven, I had flew. I flew out at eight a.m. Uh, they that was the beginning of when they brought me. I kid you not, six meals a day. They brought me <laughs> three vegetarian and three meat, and like. I wasn't done with breakfast by the time they're knocking on my door, leaving lunch at the door. And then I'm not done with lunch by the time they're knocking on my door, telling me dinner's there. And I'm like, I have stacks on stacks of chips and like boxes 
and like drinks that I don't know what to do with. And you feel terrible because a lot of it gets wasted. You're also not exercising. So I'm just taking in like freaking 3000 calories a day. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Mike, I'm curious about about this because you had to quarantine for what seven days mm. off site before you actually went into the bubble, and then you had to quarantine. In there. Can, can you take us through just what the whole quarantine process yeah. is like to get into the actual bubble? Yeah, so I I get there the day after Game Seven, and I stay one night in the Waldorf Astoria that is outside the bubble. It's mm, about 15 nice. minutes outside the bubble. I order ridiculous room service. This is before I'm in the bubble, so I'm I can't leave. I'm ordering pizzas and like, you know, salmon and like, I'm having a up. great time. And then uh, you, the, you're I needed, ordering. Like, wait, hold on. You're ordering salmon. <laughs> Whose tab is this yeah, on? Who's, wait, and where do you get? Where do you order salmon from? Like it, pizza. It was, like, it was just like in room dining. Like I had oh, very I got, limited okay. options. Oh, okay, got okay. You. And again, my head's still spinning. Just accept it. I order what I order. <laughs> you did just say everyone has their own food opinion. So whatever. Um, so I, I take a negative. T- I take my test. That was the first thing I did. Oh, they like picked me up from from the airport. They're holding like an NBA sign. I feel like I've never been in a situation like this, and I'm like, yeah. well. You know, that looks like me. It's the NBA sign. <laughs> and like, like no, sorry. This, like, uh, that's actually for Tim Conley. I'm sorry. sorry. Right, right. I get in this like <laughs> chauffeured car. It takes me to the campus. I get tested. Then I go to the Waldorf. I stay there the night. I'm like making all kinds of calls, telling people what it's like. It's like it's, you know, your general, your, your mm-hmm. generic hotel room. I clear the negative test that day, uh, the next day. And then they take you into the bubble. Like it was after the first day when I go into the bubble, you get tested again and you basically like you walk into your room. There's like a 24 pack of water. There's orange juice. There's frappuccinos in the um, in the refrigerator. There's food already sitting there. And I already told you they gave me (laughs) way too much food. And so I'm just like getting my bearings straight, trying to like wrap my head around this. The only time I'm able to leave over the ensuing next six days is, is once a day to go get my daily test. Um, and it's like a 300 foot round trip test. Like I walk uh, 300 feet, I'm at the testing room and, um, and then I, you do your little swab, which was not the invasive one. You come back and that was it. Like, so what's really funny is they, they NBA ended up switching the protocol because people were taking advantage and, and like doing laps around the, the campus when they needed to get their test to get exercise in. But when they realized people were taking up or abusing it, they ended up moving the daily test room to closer to where the media was staying. So like I literally walked 600 feet a day outside. That was it. That's really, I'm laughing because it's absurd, but I, I mean, honestly, this is the sacrifice everybody had to make to make this thing happen. And it's, we can all make our jokes about the comfort or this or that, but it really is like prison. I have a cousin that's there. He tells me that, you know, it's like they work extra days because it's the most exciting part of their day. And it sounds like, yes, you were like testing. Yes. Here I go. I I go you, you, you go in there, they give you a pulse oximeter, they give you a, a thermometer and you have to hook it up to your app. And then you have to plug in, you have to record daily, your temperature, your oxygen levels, like, it was pretty rigorous. The The most exciting thing that happened on one of my walks was maybe like 600 feet behind me was this like seven foot one giant. And I was like, OK, that's probably an NBA player. Like, I don't know who it is. And I kid you not, like I'm walking at a normal pace. He's walking at his normal pace. Like 10 seconds later, JaVale McGee is standing next to me on the path uh, <laughs> after my test. And, uh, and, you know, they had just played, like, game two or game one against the Lakers. And, and I was like, what's up, JaVale? And he's like, hey, man. And I was like, you know, I'm actually here covering the Nuggets. And he was like, oh, oh, boy. And then just, like, kept walking. And that was my JaVale interaction. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> and he did not – he barely played over the rest of the series after that. Right. Right. <laughs> so we have um, – you know, I know we have a, a an image here I'm going to pull up. And this is of the fabled uh, pickleball. Oh, it's, yes. First of all, what are we looking at? Are we looking at this is where you're staying? Is this the hotel where media is? So, all right. What I think was not clearly documented, because I don't think people cared about this, but I'll just say there the bubble was a lot smaller than people realized. So oh. the media had probably a 1,500 to 2,000 foot corridor where they could walk. Like where they stay, <laughs> then like you walk a little bit to down this path, 
there's like a lake on the left side, so you, which is where you see like the famous restaurant in the middle of the lake. That's where the players yeah. can go. The executives can go. We're not allowed there. So you can walk down this path. To the right is the daily testing in like this random room. Then a little bit further down the path is a pickleball court. This pickleball court, Scott Foster, NBA referee Scott Foster, brought the pickleball court to the bubble. Oh, and wow. at 8.30 in the morning, every single morning, the NBA referees are there playing pickleball. You don't realize this about the NBA referees. They only worked one out of every five or six days. Oh, wow. So pickleball wow. became a religion. And I was like, awesome. you know, after I got out of quarantine, I was like determined to soak up every little second of it. Like I wasn't going to hang out in my room at all. Yeah, I yeah. played more pickleball than I'm comfortable sharing publicly. <laughs> I have never played pickleball. I've never yeah, even thought about that. playing nope. pickleball. I'm not actually sure what it is other than Me I can kind of tell from this it's a tennis sport. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a mix of ping pong and tennis. Just play. It's like for non-athletic people who, who oh. want to like exercise. And in that <laughs> picture, Scott Foster is on the right side. of the, Scott Foster's in the black. And then if you see the guy in the pink shirt with a salmon shirt, that is Richard Jefferson. You can kind of tell, yeah. And I, and the crowning moment of my uh, bubble experience was when I beat Richard Jefferson in pickleball. <laughs> and I dropped a shot on Richard Jefferson that made him so mad, he threw his racket into the bushes. I swear to God. That's a good anecdote. I'm glad I know that. It, it didn't get any better than that. Hey, I think I know the answer to this. Does But does he talk a lot of trash when he's playing pickleball, Richard Jefferson? <laughs> He doesn't because he's not very good. Like, ah, yeah, he, you, good you think he has like a big wingspan, but like we're all – none of us know how to play pickleball. So we're all learning on the fly and also, Scott Foster's like calling us out. That's illegal. That's illegal. That ball was out. What are you going to do? Oh, Question God. Scott Foster's oh, balls. God. Does he hold court? I mean like not – not. is he just – who's the center of attention in these things? Is it Scott Foster? It's, it's got, got it. Are you kidding? It's yeah, got to be it's Scott a, Foster. I, so I made like basically I'm in I'm in one game. Scott Foster is like sitting on the side. And by the way, like I think that throughout the duration, I think about 30 like high quality pickleball rackets were ordered from Amazon. <laughs> I love it. I'm People not kidding. People are starting to get into it like real like, like trying to find Richard edges. Richard Jefferson definitely ordered an expensive paddle. For <laughs> I love it. Um and so he, like, like Scott Foster's monitoring these games, and I made like a bad call, or like I just kept a rally going where the ball was like uh, evidently like six inches out. And after the rally, I think we lost the point. Someone was like, "Scott, was that out?" He was like, "Oh yeah, that was out." Like he he very much made me feel like a schmuck for playing it, and I was like, "Cool, dude." Like I just want to play pickleball. <laughs> That's funny. That's ridiculous. Um. So I want to ask about the players and how much interaction you had. And also just, you know, you were there for, what, uh, thir 11 days, 12 days? What was the total count you were there? In, in quarantine for seven days, out of quarantine for five days. I couldn't even hit the one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah, that's a bummer. But, but still, so you were there for 12 days. And were you, like, did, did you get, were you there long enough for maybe the anxiety of being there to kind of wear on you? And then can you kind of just talk about what it was like for those guys that were there for 80 days or however many it was that the Nuggets were there for? Yeah, there, there was no anxiety on my part. Like, in fact, it was, it was whatever the op comfort, I guess, because you're mm. getting tested every day. You just That's don't want to, yeah. you just don't want to be the jackass that brings the, the, the virus into the bubble. Like I right, was right. so, I was just like, please let me test negative. Cause you get off a plane and you're like, I'm not entirely positive. I was careful, but you know, you don't right, know. Of course, of course. And so, um, yeah. So you, I don't know. You, you get tested. You start feeling comfortable. And like I said, I just did everything that I possibly could. I even went to the uh, Heat Celtics game five. Like I sat, ended up sitting next to Steve awesome. Smith, who yeah. he and I became pretty good friends. Like the dude is unbelievable. He's on NBA TV, and he's just, this is like the amount. Of, these are the people who I ended up just hanging out with because there wasn't anything else to do. My first night out was um, Heat Celtics game four, and I didn't know if I could go, and I ultimately learned that I could, but it ended up being Jared Greenberg's birthday. So we ended up, there's mm. a bar inside. We go and hang out there. I'm sitting next to Steve Smith. Jared Greenberg's there. Allie LaForce is over there. And we're just, like, sitting there drinking, like, watching Tyler Hero, you know, go crazy. I think that was the game where Tatum had, like, 30 in the second half. Mm. And so – 
it was just those kind of interactions that were inevitable that happened at every turn. Like you just have dinner and like, there's Steve Smith, there's Richard Jefferson. Like uh, there weren't I just, that many people though, right? Like when you talk about the media, I mean, the, I saw the picture. I can't remember who it was. Dan Wokey maybe Dan posted Wiki. it. Wiki. Oh, he posted it and there was like 20 people. And I was like, wow, man, that's a small contingent. Shout out Dan Wokey. He brought me a six pack of beer while I was in quarantine. That was very hey, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was very nice. nice. Um, if only it was Breck Brew. If only. Yeah. If only. <laughs> yeah, what a, what a homie right here. I, I, I'm, I'm yeah. taking up for D-Line. I'm taking up. That's fine. <laughs> well done. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, like, there, there weren't a lot of people. Like, you have the media partners. You have ESPN. You have TNT. You have, and they probably had, like, three to four each on-air people who you, everyone would recognize. But the, the people you don't think about are the production crews. And yeah. that's a lot of people. Like, right. I don't know if you saw at the end of the ABC broadcast last night, they put a picture up of, like, maybe – 200 people like mm-hmm. that was all the people behind the scenes so my guess is when i was in the bubble i i would guess there were four to five hundred people mm-hmm. um and, and then the, the the independent media really were talking like 12 to 15 people that's crazy uh, usa today athletic new york times boston globe la times associated press sports illustrated um i think I mean, and then like a few others, but like, that's it. The fact that they allowed the Denver Post in, unbelievably lucky. Like, yeah. obviously it's because of the Nuggets, they went on their run, but like they made a huge exception. I was the only person, I, I was the second to last person they let on the, on tier one of the bubble. Um, and it was only because the Nuggets went that far. As soon as I got out, the guy who was in quarantine was Dave McMenamin at ESPN. And so... He, he I, like I saw him. I think right ahead of Game Five, and he was like, "So you leaving tomorrow?" And I was like, "All right, jackass." Like, <laughs> um, so so that was it. it Imagine if he would have got there and uh, the Lakers lose. I mean, it would have been. Uh, I mean, <laughs> the Nuggets had staffers who were quarantining in Orlando who didn't ever get out. Oh, that's mm-hmm. so. That's a bummer. It, 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 and it all happened. And, and like. Um, Uh, Ryan Bowen, Nuggets assistant coach, had to quarantine after getting surgery. He had, Mm. I believe, uh, I think he had like a patellar surgery, patellar tendon surgery. Uh, And instead of going home, he left for a day, comes back and quarantines for seven days during the conference finals. And this is one of their head coach or one of their assistant coaches. Um, In terms of the interactions with the players, like I saw like I saw Michael Porter Jr. and, and Torrey Craig riding around on bikes like often. They were, and and one time Porter like rolls up and just drops his bike and then walks in and leaves it and I was like that's weird he didn't even like use the kickstand or anything like, <laughs> that seems on brand that's it, yeah sense. I don't know if it's random or not I was just like that's this a great season, observation maybe, I was just like dude just pick the bike up um, and um, I don't know you see like Jeremy Gr- like so 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 there's that bridge and then it goes to the restaurant in the middle of the lake which is where I wasn't able to go, but from where the players were staying at the Grand Casino, they had to walk past this like patio where I could sit and do work. So like if I sat there, um, pretty much like I would, you know, I, I didn't opt to do this, but if I sat there, I could have seen people walk into the bridge. One time I did see Cal Calvin Booth. Another time I saw Tim Connolly the day after they lost, and he was like, you know, he, he was in the spirits that you would expect him to be in so like there were moments where you would have these interactions i saw actually the first day i got there they're down 2-1 and i go to practice and it was i can't you guys would have the exact same interaction um i go there and it was almost like liberating to see the team who you guys have relationships with up and down the team and they're all like you know no one was aware that i was coming no one gave a damn that i was coming but like they, I wouldn't say excited, but they were like, oh, that's a familiar face. Like somehow sure. Mike ended up and did the quarantine and all this stuff. Like I had some very authentic, like real conversations um, with Gary, with Wes Unsell Jr., uh, with Malone. Malone was messing with me as soon as he saw me. One thing that uh, I don't think I ever shared was I was talking to Gary Harris and they're down or yeah, they're down two one at this point, And I'm just we're just BSing about the three one comebacks and whatever. And I'm like, man, like, do you think you guys can pull this? He was like, man, when we pull this off, they're going to make a 30 for 30 about us. <laughs> and it was just like, it was Great. such a cool, like, it, you know, he couldn't even tell me what day it was. He didn't know what month sure. it was. He was like, I'm, it's such a mind warp in here. 
Yeah. Um, and, and just, again, just some of those interactions were invaluable to, to, to see the guys again. Like we've all been around every single day. You're there. You, you don't cover them for months in person. You, you, you were active. We're proactive. We try to, you know, be engaging from, from afar. And that's just tough. But once I got to see them that one practice day, it was so much fun. Like, you know, Malone was just messing with me. I think, I don't know if you guys saw, he's like, Denver Post finally showed up for the conference finals. And I was like, it's nice to see you too. Um, But um, to to that point though, Mike, I mean, could could you get a sense from the five days you spent in there, like what it was like for the players and coaches just to be in there for like 80 to 90 days? Could you just get a sense of that, like how that impacted them emotionally? Because I kept going back to that anecdote. I think it was Jalen Brown had about sharing right. that elevator with Mason Plumley, right. where Mason was just like giving himself positive affirmations just to stay locked in just enough. Like I haven't stopped thinking about that. Could you get a sense of, of that aspect at all? Just being closer to the guys. Dude, I can list like on one hand, the places that the team can go. Yeah. Like, That's what it sounds go- like. They can go to their hotel room. By the end of it, when I got there, which is around, like, let's say day 70-ish, like, guys weren't hanging out at night. Guys were just going back to their hotel room. There was no, like – and that's not, you know, a knock on the camaraderie or the chemistry at all. That's just, like, exhaustion. There was nothing else to do. So you could either hang out in your hotel room. You could – walk down a hallway it was basically like a hotel convention center kind of think of it like that you walk down a hallway you you sign in with your magic band it tells you that your temperature's fine whatever and um there's like ballrooms where there's courts set up so they would just go to these courts and that was you know the most exciting thing they did during the day they have like a team room where they can eat their meals and i think play board games on, on some nights and so it's like, the, the, I mean, that was, those were the options. It was that, Exciting. or you, you could rent a bike where like, I think, um, I think they ended up buying more bikes. Disney ended up like, it started off with only like 15 or 20 bikes. And they think they ended up getting about 50 bikes by the end of it because people like needed these bikes just to ride around for sanity purposes. And the, like, the, fi- the fishing seems like something that happened a lot over the first couple weeks that everybody got there. And then eventually everybody was over it. A hundred percent. It lost its luster. So like th- yeah. there were on it. I'm not exaggerating. You could go to the restaurant, you could go to the meal room, you could hang out in your room. You could go get shots up like this. Well, you was, can tell how boring it is by your story about you were like, you know, one time I saw that bridge, <laughs> different people on the bridge, like Calvin one time went to that bridge and uh, like just <laughs> going to the bridge is like an event. And it's like, OK, well, yeah, that's that's probably not that fun. I want to move on, though, because I want to ask you about the inside the actual arena, yep. because you post you, you sent this picture. Um, and what's interesting is I don't think I've seen a single picture of the stands and you kind of have a little tiny bit of it here, but if maybe you take this for granted since you got to see inside of it, I have no idea what the orientation of that court was like you, they, they only showed you the one angle. You could see those video screens around it, but what, what size arena was this in and just what did it look like? The parts we can't see. So the NBA did a really good job. You know how, like, I don't know if, 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 in like an NFL arena, if if people aren't seated there, they ended up blacking out all the seats. They drape things over the seats. Right, right, so yeah. it looked a lot better aesthetically. There were aspects of that. But I would say it felt like maybe like a 1,500-person arena, including the second tier. I so like Cox like, Pavilion? What would you say? Like Cox Pavilion at Summer League? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like that. Or like – what's the what's the college tournament is it like the maui invitational that only has like 1500 seats or like 2000 seats? it's in like a very small arena so there's so like there's no real seating in the lower bowl right there's like there's the court then to the side there's maybe like 25 chairs all socially distanced for like family and fans um like like tim and cal that's where they sat Uh, above that there's like these these like glass visors that are almost like penalty boxes where all the owners sat. You guys saw it in the finals. That's where Jeannie Buss, Pat Riley were, um, Mickey Harrison was. Um, and they're sort of like cordoned off so that they can't they don't spit or cheer too loudly and it goes down to tier one. Um, and, and then there are some media seating um, next to those next to those like I don't know, ice hockey penalty box type things, which is where tier two sat. And they, and they did a really good job of separating those two. And then 
uh, next to that little platform where there was 20 to 25 seats, there's like, I don't know, three rows of like escalating media seating. Um, and, and that's where we sat. And then there was about like four or five baseline seats on either side. And those were like contentious. Like you had to get there early to get those. And <laughs> everybody wants those because you're close to the you're close to the bench. You can hear the players talking crap. Like I heard Tory Craig yapping his mouth, Dwight Howard, which was fantastic. Yeah. Um, how much of so, that was there? Because have you you've sat courtside? I'm guessing before for different things. You know, that's not too often. People don't realize media in Denver is a little bit removed. You can't really hear people talking. How much of that could you hear? And how much has your perspective changed on, like, what happens on an NBA basketball court during a game? So I I didn't personally hear this, but somebody told me the things that uh, Marcus Morris said to the referee were jaw dropping, and they, that didn't yield technical fouls. Like Marcus wow. Morris in the second round, hmm. the things that he said were just like very disrespectful. And like you, like we don't, we never hear those things. And there's a reason right. we never hear those things. The NBA doesn't want us to hear those things. Right. The things that are said are very disrespectful to each other, to uh, NBA referees, and like a lot of stuff just flies. Um, but being there, you hear guys like just yapping. There's in Rajon Rondo runs his mouth during free throws. Like, it is hilarious. You know, that's kind of his shtick. And um, I think they conscientiously they put us on the far side of the basket stanchion, not on the close side. I think Malone would have had an aneurysm if I was next to uh, <laughs> So that didn't happen. But, like, I mean, I could see into team huddles. I could I, – I see, like, Jamal stretching out his leg throughout game five when he looks like – I mean, it was pretty obvious how hobbled he was. And I couldn't yeah. hear the broadcast. Apparently they said early on that he, his leg was messed up, but yeah. like I see him visibly limping and like going into these timeouts, trying to stretch it and work on his leg. And he just didn't look right. So yeah. I, I hope that answers it. Like I, it's an unbelievable perspective, but like, again, like by the end of it, everybody wanted to sit baseline and everyone kind of understood that because I was probably only going to be there for a few games, they were like, okay, nobody Mike can have those seats. It, it's fine. That's, that's um, funny. That's very sweet of them. It was <laughs> very sweet. It's very sweet. Uh, I want to play a little bit of, uh, of a game here now and just kind of play a little fill in the blank um, because uh, there's bubble stories. There's a lot to it, but I kind of want to look a little more bigger picture at the Nuggets now because we're starting to gain our offseason perspective and, and, and think about what this season meant for Denver. First thing I want to ask you, this is something I'm kicking around a lot over the last 24 hours. The play, the level of play – the level of basketball inside the bubble was blank. What? What? Oh, it was blank. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it, the, the computer froze, and I was like, ah. Oh. Yeah, it's that Commerce City internet coming in. Oh, come on, you look at Harrison. Here. He's he's so he's fuzzy, right? It's Harrison's internet. He's fuzzy, but you're lacking now, bro. You're lagging. Oh, you're I it. would say, and I don't know if it needs to be one word, but I would say better than expected. I, mm. Like. In my opinion, I thought that teams rose to the level of play, rose to the stage. Um, I think it was pretty clunky to begin with, and especially that would happen after four, four and a half months off. Um, but by the end, I thought we were seeing like peak basketball. Um, and one one thing that I did want to include on that, I, I talked to Richard Jefferson and he told me this really interesting anecdote. He was like, this is no disrespect to Jamal Murray. But look at the guys who had moments in the bubble or who, who made names for themselves. They were all young guys. Yeah. Devin Booker, um, uh, TJ Warren, uh, Jamal Murray, Tyler Hero, Duncan Robinson. Like, they didn't have to go on the road in hostile yeah. playoff environments and kill it. And so call it shade, call it, you know, reality, call it some truth. Like it's the, young, the, the bubble benefited young guys, in, in my opinion. George, George Carl made the same point. In fact, he actually said it before the bubble began. That was his predict prediction. He was talking, I think, specifically about Michael Porter, but he said, my thing is, if Michael Porter had to go into his first playoffs and has a bad game in one of the first two and then has to go on the road, as a coach, I just know I wouldn't be able to trust him because nobody knows how hard that is. But not have So he kind of predicted this, and I think, I think it's I, – I don't think it's shade. I just think it's a one less obstacle that young players especially didn't have to overcome. Definitely. I mean, these guys were just all in rhythm. And that's, the, I think, in my opinion, the one word you hear from these players the most in the locker room is rhythm. rhythm. Mm. And So rhythmic you, would be your word. 
Yes, exactly. <laughs> Rhythmness. <laughs> so when you don't have to go back and forth, you know what I mean? That's just one more thing that doesn't... Like, if you're feeling yourself, you're yeah. feeling yourself until that bad game comes. And for these guys at this level, we saw, you know, Mitchell, Murray, a lot of guys, really. It was like, if there's nothing here to knock me down off this peg, I'm staying up here. I'm living in this space. So my fill-in-the-blank would be above average. And I mean that above average for a playoff series. And playoffs are always elevated, but... There was no travel. There was no fans, to your point, all the, all that stuff. And there was, I would say, fewer distractions. Look, I don't know how NBA players live, but I do know it sounds like from your story inside the bubble, it was impossible to distract yourself. And it sounds like even more so getting uh, outside. Daniel of, House. Well, okay, with, <laughs> with few exceptions. But it seemed like even getting outside and playing games was the highlight of everyone's day. And I know that's usually the case in a playoffs, but it seems even more like – Sweet. This is we get out of the building. We get out now. We get to do this thing that we we like doing. Um, so above average, Harrison. Do you want to throw a word or a phrase or anything? Yeah, I'd agree with all those. And then I'd also just say better than expected because it's easy to oh, forget. Phrase. But uh, <laughs> coming into the bubble, there were like a lot of questions about what the quality of play would be like. Guys hadn't played in three four months. Giannis hadn't or Chris Middleton hadn't somehow touched a ball in four months which I, I still just can't fathom. But yeah, sure. the level of, level of play was uh, w- was pretty incredible, I thought, just for the layoff that teams had. And, you know, at the end of it, the two best teams in the bubble, probably the Lakers and the Heat met in the finals, and the clear best team in the NBA won. So yeah. it, in the end, it kind of finished how most regular seasons do. Let's go to another fill-in-the-blank here, Mike. Um, Jamal Murray's performance in the bubble was – blank uh i mean special or or, or all-star caliber um elite i took a lot of words i'm sorry guys (laughs) all right there's nothing left (laughs) but one of my questions is one of the big questions about what he did was we're talking okay you don't want to take anything this is why i don't think it's shade but you do have to wonder, is it replicable? Was this a bubble performance or is this kind of the new Jamal Murray? I mean, where do you land on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny because you almost feel like it takes an impetus. It takes something for Jamal to get to that level. Yeah. So he, he got to that level uh, sometimes last year in, in the 14 playoff games against San Antonio and then Portland. Um and he obviously did it. He rose to that moment multiple times this postseason. So you wonder if he just like, is it a malaise? Is it a, is it a, um, I'm not that stoked about an 82. Like you don't want these guys already taking for granted the regular season. You don't want them to, you know, guys to just start looking past it again, but it's hard because you get a taste and you, the first year they made the postseason, they almost taste the Western conference finals. You're like, all right, let's just bypass. Let's hit, sim on on nba 2k let's just get to the to the uh, postseason so i do feel like i think he has that level to him but he's such a passionate like emotionally fueled player that you do kind of wonder is it the postseason that brings the best out of him not necessarily a bad thing but like can you extract that and can you stretch that over 82 games and and the nuggets are asking themselves that too like how do how, how the hell do you how does that manifest? How can you predict how um, sustainable that is? They, they don't know, but I think Malone talked about it. He said, we want to see this type of production, energy, uh, even if you're not scoring the defense and the playmaking uh, on a consistent basis for six months before the postseason. Then you'll get your all-star appearance. You'll get your all-NBA chatter. Then you'll get your due. Um, but, I mean, I, it, this is something you build off of. These 19 games were unbelievable. To know that he uh, has that, I think to know that he has that in the tool bag is is the single most important thing. And one of the benefits, one of the many benefits of having Jokic on this team, is the Nuggets don't need Murray to play at that level to be a top three seed out west to win fifty plus games. They just don't. And so, if he can spend a, a regular season the way he wants to, whether that's experimenting with shot profile, just sort of staying healthy, playing his way into shape, I think the team now knows we're in a seven game playoff series. If Jamal needs to go into that thermonuclear mode, it's inside of him. And he knows that too. So I don't, you know, I don't know if we see, like if he plays at this level, he's a lock for an all-star. And he is at the, at the level of the Dames and the Steffs. I'm not sure we see that in the regular season, but I am almost positive we see it when they need it from him in the postseason. 
Uh, my word would be career altering. Like, I, I really think that this is going to be the defining moment of Jamal Murray's career. Um, you know, like, P- yes, pivotal he, he's moment. Still... I think you mean pivotal, right? Not, not the, career defining almost sounds yeah. like this would be the, the best peak. Yeah, the peak. Yeah. It's all P- P- pivotal career. might be a better word. It, he yeah. is still just, what, 22, Three. 23. Um, so he could have a lot more pivotal moments, but this definitely feels like it's going to be one for me. And just what he did on the court, what he did off the court, finding his voice, the leadership, it just all came together for him. It, like this was his moment in the bubble. And uh, I think it's going to stick with him for years to come and seasons to come. But heading into the regular season, what I think to look for in terms of like things transferring over from the bubble and if he can, you know, repl- replicate the level that he played at, him just taking over games, just in a five minute stretch or in a quarter, the way he did in the bubble, I think that's going to be translatable over, you know, to the regular season. He's not going to be able to play at the level he did in the bubble for 82 or for 60 or for how many regular season games we end up playing. But how he took over games, I think that's going to be very translatable. Just kind of another indicator that he's taken the leap. Yeah, I would say it was his December 15th moment. To me, that that's what it feels like. With Jokic, there was the moment where he said, okay, he's that dude. He's the he's the centerpiece. I think with Murray, what you saw now is a guy that you say, okay, he's also the centerpiece. And um, whether or not he reaches this level again or plays it in the, the, the regular season, I don't know. What I do know is that the Nuggets team, I think, feels like, okay, he's our guy. There's no questions asked. Like that – they have an enormous amount of faith with him that would take a lot for them to lose that faith. So – that should carry him into the next year. The next one I have here is, and this is an interesting one, the Nuggets running it back next season would be blank. Hmm. Would be – and and by running it back, do we mean – is there no, ambiguity here? Do we mean getting to the conference finals? No, no, no. I just mean – Oh, with the with the same yeah, team. I'm just saying, yeah, more or less the same, meaningfully the same team. So maybe there's like one guy you add that's like a, the eighth best player, whatever. But it, more or less saying, hey, this is our team. We're 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 just going to keep climbing with this group. Let's let's get a little weird, and I would say surprising. I, okay. I I think I, if I'm Tim Connolly, I am calling up David Griffin, and I am vetting what it would take to get Drew Holiday on the Nuggets. And given that he only has one year left on his contract um, and the Nuggets have assets and young assets and draft picks, I am doing what I can to get Drew Holiday to Denver. Um, What does that take in your mind? In my opinion, uh, the framework of the deal, I've had this in my mind for a week or two, is Gary Harris, the first round pick, and Bull Bull. Mm. Um, that's what I think it takes. Uh, you know, I, I think that there was interest at the trade deadline. I think that the Pelicans did like Gary Harris. Obviously his stock is not what it was two seasons ago, but doesn't Gary Harris feel like a classic, like uh, change of scenery guy, like get, get him a new place and, and no expectations, like not a huge market in new Orleans. Like let's just, let me get my feet set again. Um, He's also a guy a, you would want on like a, a rebuilding team like the Pelicans with a bunch yeah. of young guys. He, he's a Gary's a great dude. He's a he's a good you know really team oriented guy. It would probably be gut wrenching for the Nuggets to give him up, given that he's the longest tenured guy there. Um, but you know to answer your question, I think that I I think that there needs to be like a like a top five player move in. It, I think mm-hmm. the top five like people on their team the personnel needs to be shaken up a little bit right i would so i'm going to go against you and say it would be not surprising if the nuggets run it back it would be not surprising because yeah. i don't think I, I don't think it would be surprising either way I, what, that they go but i just almost feel like there's a better chance than not that the top five guys on the nuggets roster next year are the same top five guys maybe you could say Millsap falls out of there but it's still back and you know or what have you but I, I don't know. I just it doesn't seem to me like th- that would be too much of a surprise. Uh, vote and Harrison. I guess I'll go to you first, Harrison, this time. But don't you pick surprising. Don't pick not surprising. I want. I more want to know what you think about if that's the case. If they do just run it back from a value um, standpoint. 
it would almost be like classic nuggets or, or typical <laughs> nuggets <laughs> like a, a typical nuggets path okay um, classic nuggets is good. <laughs> and look i don't know i don't think it's necessarily the wrong decision because right. as we've talked about on this show all like all off season in the last uh, two weeks um Next season is about Michael Porter Jr. becoming that third piece. I mean, that's what next regular season is about. I don't think there's really any other thing that takes priority over that. Um, and that's where I think the most growth is going to come from. Uh, so it, it would be kind of the Nuggets sticking to the script. And I, I don't think that's necessarily an incorrect decision if they were to, to do that. Agreed. I would say, for that reason, I would say it's tenable. Um, I think you could defend that against multitude of, of objections and 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 like get the reality is they they've run it back um and, and gotten better every year and improved every season uh under malone and, and company so if they choose to do it again there will be people who will be disappointed but i don't think there would be a ton a much of a leg to stand on and say like hey this is complacency uh but again like we've talked about it a lot on this show it's not just running it back then how do you what's your approach with this same roster you know, is it still trying to win every night with the vets and such? Or do we sort of turn the page and move over to that younger core and let the kids play? I said this on Locked On last night that it might be that there's no right answer. And what you choose one answer and you end up never getting over the hump and everyone says, well, you should have gone the other way on this. But it's, right, right. the truth is, it's really hard to win a championship. And it's very possible that Denver just gets out of this. And it's like, I don't know. We had a bunch of, you know, tough choices, but none of them would have been a guaranteed shoe in. Um not re-signing Jeremy Grant would be blank, Mike. Would be... Or I should say losing Jeremy Grant is a better way to put it. Ju- losing Jeremy Grant would be uh, <laughs> dumbfounding to me. Um, they, You know, they're not... Because of their cap situation, they cannot get a player of his caliber on the free agent market. You have a chance, because he is currently on your roster, to sign him go over the cap, and pay him uh, what is fair value. Jeremy Grant does not think that he, that over the last year or two, his $9 million deal, in his mind, has not been commiserate with what his production is on the court. So if you can pay him and the Nuggets do a good job of keeping their guys happy, then you pay him and you find a way to make it work. It is a mutually beneficial thing. They can pay him more money. They can pay him longer. Um and he knows that it, they know that he is a very valuable asset and he knows he can win with them and likes the culture and likes the locker room. Like to me, I would be stunned if he, if he didn't come back. Is there any world in which he doesn't come back, but it's not because of money? Uh, to, I mean, you know, if, if a team like Atlanta offers him more than 20 million, which I, I mean, I, I mean, not, it's not because of money. Cause I, I agree with you that I think Denver's in the driver's seat for saying, Hey, we can, even if we have to overpay, we can do this or, you know, there's flexibility there, but is there any chance he just says, I don't know. I want to, I've always wanted to play for the warriors or, you know, I, I'm just throwing out a team, but I'm saying that there, uh, some, yeah. something. I, I don't think so. I, his, I, I've reported his preference is to stay. He, he wants yeah. to stay in Denver. Like, I think he's very comfortable here. I think that imagine what it does for you, your confidence when a team goes out and gets you, when they, 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 they they identify you on Oklahoma city. They say, we're going to give up a a first round pick for you because you fit our time frame. We've had our eye on you for a long time. Tim Connolly is unbelievable at making relationships, longstanding relationships has known Jeremy Grant and known the Grant family for a long time. Um, Like, it makes a lot of sense that he would want to stay here. And Grant is, is, is kind of, you know, he's not, he's, he's somewhat of an introvert. And like, to me, you need that trust factor. Like, is he really going to jeopardize his prime years for a, a situation and sign up for the longest contract of his, of his career for a situation he's uncomfortable and doesn't True. necessarily know to right. me. I, I can't see it. I, yeah. I mean, someone throws you 25 million i would do a lot of stupid things for 25 million dollars but <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna skip us on this one guys because i think we all kind of agree with with everything mike has yeah. there um last one though fill in the blank next season begins on <sighs> oh man um i i think uh mlk day what is it january 18th i think we that's what we decided yep we don't decide that we looked it up I was gonna say, we, yeah, we, that's what we googled <laughs> 
Uh, we looked call, it up, and to me, that feels like a good date. Although I've heard the the NBPA, Michelle Roberts, the the president of the Players Union, I think I've heard she's pushed for February, a February start date. Um, you know, like I know that on the back end, they're worried about running into the Olympics. Uh, which is a real concern. And, and, and they have said that they want to play 82 games next year. So I, I like, are, are they going to do pods? Adam Silver did not rule out more bubbles next Almost year. Almost hinted at it, yeah. He didn't rule it out. And it was kind of like, a, a you, do you know the angst and the stress and the strain that you put on the players in the league this year? And they all did it in good faith. But, like, asking them to do it again is a big ask. Right. Um, so – I don't know, mid to late January. Um, the real question for me is uh, the draft and free agency. I've heard rumblings that the draft is going to get moved back. The draft is November 18th, and I don't think it's going to happen November 18th. <laughs> and what does that mean for free agency? Man. Like, are we going to get to Christmas and – be doing negotiations like talk to me about thanksgiving like i don't want my thanksgiving ruined again like mm. come on now the, the like the team and and selfishly media needs something to hang our hats on to plan our lives yeah that's a that's a really good point about i didn't i just always assumed they were going to do it on the 18th and there was no hiccup there but um that would uh, it is going to be weird these next few months how it's all uh, so hit or miss. I, again, Harrison and, and vote. I think we just skip us because we got to get out of this. Uh, we only got ten minutes here, and I want to get to LeBron because I think now LeBron takes center stage in in he's always center stage in the NBA. He's the biggest athlete in probably in the world, but certainly in the NBA. And I think a lot of people, myself included, thought, okay, LeBron has never not been great in the playoffs, but. They're almost like he had to prove it this this go round, just because you know he missed last year, and there were moments where it looked like okay, maybe he's a little bit less than athletically than before. My personal opinion after watching this is I think LeBron is as good as he's ever been. I don't know that he can be as good as he's ever been for eighty two games. I don't even know if he can be that good for four rounds. But I do think that when push came to shove, LeBron just is in a comfort, confidence, and control standpoint right now of the game that. Um, that rivals any of his previous seasons and in some ways is better than it. Does that feel like a hot take to you, Mike? No, because we're, we're somewhat at the point where like, yes, his, if we all acknowledge his athleticism has decreased from when, you know, six, seven years ago, maybe as peak of his athleticism, but he's also at the height of his command of his game. So uh, wherever those, at the height of the command, like there's no yeah. question about it. Is that a good phrase? Height of the command. Uh, I don't, I don't know if it is, but I, 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 I got it. it is, but that's what <laughs> I mean. What you're like down. They, they've met somewhere in the middle. Like yes. he's at peak efficiency of the mental component and of the, like the, 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 no, the, like know when you need to assert yourself and dominate and, and know when you need to pull back a little bit. Like everything is in, he is in total control. The dude is like a puppeteer. Like he yeah. just pulls all the strings, everything. knows when he needs to. And like, is he, is he the ultimate 16 game player? You know, that, that we define Draymond green by like, he's up there, like, yeah. but he can also <laughs> do it in the regular season. So the, the dude, the, like I, when we talk about, you know, the, the Jordan debate, the thing that sticks out to me is the longevity the command, the, I mean, he's been in the league 17 years. How many years has he been the best player? 15 of them? Like, so this brings me to the plus, other point right? I kind of want to get to. And first of all, I want to just say this. When you watched game five, and I know the Lakers lost that one, but you talk about, okay, he's lost. They met in the middle athletically. That was one of those games where if you didn't see any other game but that one, you would say, no, he still has 100% athleticism. I mean, the fourth quarter, he just plowed through multiple guys trying to grab him, elevated over him, and ones. And you're just thinking, like, okay, he's still more athletic than Jimmy Butler, who's one of the best athletes in the NBA. So what are we really talking about here? But um, I, I do think it, it's maybe a little bit more contained on here. But if you go back to MJ, and I don't really care to do the MJ-LeBron comparison. I only want to raise this point. Michael Jordan reached the top and then stayed there, and if – it feels maybe like he retired early in 98 or what have you, but I do think there's something too. We always assume a, a player's peak happens and then they kind of get worse, but with the greats, sometimes that actually doesn't happen. They just kind of fall off all at once because they have to retire or they get hurt or this or that. 
but they actually Jordan, you could argue in 98 was as good as he ever was in a lot of ways. Just, and I feel like maybe with LeBron, we're in this where maybe we shouldn't assume that the next couple of years are not going to be great. Maybe we should assume that the next couple of years are actually going to be better than ever before. Well, this is also Adam to that point, the first time in, in LeBron's career where he's been in an MJ type of driver's seat of like, this is, well, maybe a couple years in the Heat saga, but this is very clearly the best player on the best team. Injury luck won his way this year. Like, going forward, do you think the Lakers are going to continue to be in a position to succeed? Yes. LeBron and AD plus maybe another star. So I think 2018 Game 1 was the best I've ever seen him play. The best I've ever seen any athlete perform on any level. Um, but the talent disparity between his team and Golden State was maybe as big as it's ever been in the finals. I think we're seeing that that a very similar version of that guy, 2018, that sees the game of basketball like he's Neo with the ones and zeros, but now he has Anthony Davis, who is right. the best fit of a teammate that he's ever had. So even if the athleticism and other stuff starts to you know decline, he may be set up right for an elongated peak and, and, and for success in a way that he actually hasn't been in his career, save for two years in Miami. Yeah, we saw it against uh, against the Nuggets. He knows when he can turn it on yes. and how to turn it on and when he can kind of coast. It seemed like to me LeBron was coasting a little through those first oh, uh -huh. couple of games of the Nuggets series, man. And uh, I, would, I wouldn't say coasting. It's just I, but it it did feel like he only fired the afterburners twice. I think he fired them in game four and they he just missed all of his shots. And I think he fired him again in game five and made all of his shots. Right. And but that, he is able to do that. He, did. he is able to do that because of Anthony Davis. But, he, uh, and also, like, LeBron is able to coast a little bit in the conference finals against the Nuggets because he's saying to the Nuggets, prove it. Prove right. to me that you deserve to be here, and then I'll give you my best. If you don't warrant it, then I'm not going to – then you're not going to see the best of LeBron. I'm going to save it for whoever comes out of the East, Boston right. or Miami. Like, he has the ability – and <laughs> you know how people say, like, if you flip a switch, like, you're asking for trouble. Like, LeBron can flip switches better right. than anyone flips switches. Right, like, right. Remember, whatever year it was, um, I think it was 2018 or 19 when it was Game 7 against Boston. They were down 3-2. He had to win Game 6. Then they went, Then everyone's like, ah, oh, is this the end of LeBron? No, it was the Game 7 was in Boston. LeBron was like, this is not the end of my time. Right. I'm going to the finals. And to go to the finals, nine of the last ten years, to have a conference finals record of, I think he's now 10-1. and one. That is insane. Wow. That to me is maybe the most unbelievable stat of of his career that he gets to that level and he doesn't lose. Right. The only time he lost, um, it must have been the first reign with the Cavs. It must have been the first run. Um, but this brings me up to what I want to talk about here because I, I I fall into this a lot. Like, okay, Jokic, how much better can he actually get? You know, oh, his three point shot can get better. He can get more. But I think what we all fail is that. LeBron's not adding that many new pieces to his game. I mean, his jumper's better than before, this or that. But it's confidence, it's understanding, and it's all these things that are hard to sort of quantify. The, the just knowing what your team needs in certain moments and the m amount a player can grow from where a player like Jokic is or Murray is or whatever, they can grow on those ways so much, and those are so impactful. And so when I look at a Jokic and we think, okay – you know, he's approaching his prime now. I think maybe he's not. You know, maybe it is a thing where he's approaching this, like, the steepest part of his learning curve and is starting to end. But there's also this other part of, I don't know, maybe Jokic of five years from now. I know that's a long way away. Maybe he's not even with Denver. But the Jokic of five years from now maybe has this confidence or this aggressiveness or this whatever else it is that he doesn't have now that it doesn't show up in the box score. But it shows up when you're just like, oh, yeah, he – goes at guys in ways that nobody can really stop or, or, or this or that. I just I think we have to evaluate players' growth differently after watching LeBron improve for 17 straight years. I'm, at that point, I want to see the Nuggets as favorites. Like, like I want right. to see them. That sure, there's a lot of expectations this year. Did anyone really expect them to go to the finals? Like, that, that would be no. far-fetched. Yeah. So I want to see the Nuggets right. with the belief going in that we should never get down 3-1, let alone multiple times. Like, we don't want to put ourselves in this situation, then don't play right. from the front because you're the better team. Like I want to see what it's like when they right. don't need to play loose and free, when they put their, their heel on, on other teams' throats. That's what I want to see. I want to see a team that believes that they're like legitimately the best and they have a founded belief. The Nuggets can talk all they want that they had real championship aspirations this year. I think before they went to the bubble, all of us were like, okay, 
I'll right, believe right. it when I see it. Right. But like, right. I want to see what they're like when when they get to a, a team that is a, a legitimate favorite a, on the caliber of a Laker team. I I, I also keep coming back to, um, you know, the the sort of point about even even with like Michael Porter because we all thought he was going to be the third piece of this or that. I mean, he has going into next season. He is such a big mystery for this team, and and who knows? It could end up panning out. It could not. He needs to make the sort of leaps that a Jamal Murray and a Jokic have. And I think a player can only get so better in the off season. I think they can get better, but they're going to get so better in the regular season. You really start to put things together, but then you can only get so much better in the regular season. You have to get to the postseason, and not just the postseason. You have to get to the second round and the third round and every level you go, you're getting a sort of training that you can't get anywhere else in the world because the basketball level is so high. The scouting is so high and the, Things you have to do are at such a high level that you can't help but learn better. It's like you're at the Whiplash Academy. You get in, ad, admission into that academy. Um, and so for me, that's why I think this run was so valuable for Denver is they got a front row seat to the greatest learning experience you can have. Great yeah. point. No. <laughs> look, I, I, go, go ahead. ahead. Hey, you go ahead. You go ahead. Uh, look, we look, Jokic was uh, figured this out, right? Like he he looked like a guy that by the end of this playoff run, by the end of the playoff series, he was figuring out what other defenses wanted to do, and at times a step ahead of them. Jamal too, and, and now Jamal is in a place where rather than reacting to things around him, he's going to start dictating, and defenses are going to start approaching the Nuggets a certain way because Jamal Murray is out there, and because of what he just did. So there is a way that they can command their talent. They can carry themselves. But I really think the word is dictate, like Mike was getting yeah. at. It's the things like falling behind mm -hmm. 3-1 or yeah. going up 3-1. Um, they may be as talented as they'll ever be, but there's a mastery of that talent that is the next level of greatness. And uh, I'm really interested to see if those guys can tap into that because I, I think they can. One way I would define LeBron's career, and I followed him as closely as I followed any athlete, and I know you, uh, most of you guys have as well, but... With LeBron, I felt like early on, he approached every game, in the playoffs especially, like a puzzle, and he was trying to solve that puzzle. I feel like as time has gone on, one, he solves puzzles a lot quicker. It doesn't take him a full game. It doesn't even Sometimes it doesn't even take him a full quarter, and it's like, okay, I got it. I got the hang of this. But I think also he does dictate in a way he didn't before. I mean, the 2011 finals was a lot of him looking around like, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing, therefore I can't do anything. Now I feel like in the rare instances he doesn't know what he's supposed to do, he still does something that works. And, and I think that's kind of the difference. And I think Jokic is much the same. He figures things out, and he very much likes to react. But that reaction speed can come even quicker to where, to your point, you don't have game three against Utah where he looks like he doesn't know where he's supposed to be on defense and offense. He's not very aggressive. Instead, maybe you have a quarter of that, but then it's solved, and he's, he's right back to it. And I think that's one of the steps for him that I kind of expect. I don't know what I expect it in one year. But I do think it's one area where you look at and go, okay, he can be meaningfully better in the coming years. Uh, I, I think uh, like Michael Porter Jr. played 19 playoff games d during this playoff run. Anthony Davis played like 13 playoff games over yeah. his first like yeah. seven years in the league. Yeah. Um, so like that playoff experience is the real thing. And Jamal had a couple of quotes about this during the playoff run. And you kind of saw it like, come to fruition in game seven against the Clippers where they just picked apart that defense where he was just like, yeah, I've seen every coverage. We've seen every right. look, we've yes. seen everything they can do. And then again, in game seven against the Clippers, like they just picked that Clippers defense apart every single, every time down the floor. And it was just debilitating. Um, so th these reps in the playoffs are invaluable and in valuable, mm -hmm. especially for somebody like Porter, who's, who's looking to make a leap. Yeah. And, like, the fact that Jamal and Nicola got their playoff indoctrination in their seasons three and four as opposed to MPJ getting in his rookie season, I, I mean, you couldn't have asked for more. But what I think we – it is really easy to forget is that we would have lost so much insight on, on Nicola, on Jamal, on Porter, had Mike Conley shot dropped. We yeah, were totally. centimeters from being uh, – what are we discussing? If, right. if, if that, Scott, if that shot drops, yeah. are we talking about blowing it up? Are we saying they got upset? Right, are we not talking about, about it, a team man. on the uh. ascent uh, equivalent to the Miami Heat? Like, and, and I and I really do appreciate how Tim goes about this. He he always he always zooms out, and he's like, 
I don't want to make rash decisions or judgments based off of what happens by the, the bounce of a ball. Like, a, you know, I, I can't control that. Like, the, the, the die are already cast. He, he's like, what tangible beliefs and things can we take away prior to that? I want to know what the, what the Nuggets thought before, and I want to know what it is after the fact. Because they very nearly did not get to learn about what it was after the fact. That's you didn't so get – Game seven uh, against the Clippers of Porter. You didn't get him being targeted. Right. Um, and, and we didn't get all of his uh, probably far too illuminating comments about touching the ball. Right. <laughs> which, which, were, uh, which were rich. Is next year going to be more fun or less fun, Mike, for Nuggets fans? I think it's going to be more fun because you got a taste of it. Uh, you got a taste of it this year. You know the capability. It's no longer far fetched to run to the conference finals and potentially, you know, test the the upper 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 echelons of the Western Conference and maybe think about their first ever finals run. Uh, and it's so sad. And I am already envisioning you guys spinning it back to Nug Life that fans can't entirely experience it at the arenas. It is so so sad to me. I think about it. I'm from Cleveland. The Browns are four and one, and nobody knows about it because nobody can go to the damn game. The, the Browns haven't won four games in haven't won four of the first five it's games so in twenty years. <laughs> like so I feel so badly. Will we get to enjoy this? And like, you know, the, this is why shows like you guys are going to be invaluable next year of trying to bring perspective and connecting people with the team because they're going to be even further removed yeah. uh, than before. It's going to be hard to connect with fans and to say, this is why you should care. Uh, but shows like you guys, you know, you know, work that we do at the post, like that's where we think we can really make headway and be like, guys, there, there's something very, very real happening with the Nuggets uh, and it feels sustainable. Well, I can't encourage you, the listeners of the show to, enough to subscribe to the Denver Post. I'm subscribed not just for Mike's great coverage, which he did a great job all year, Mike, and inside the bubble and with this Nuggets team, but also just, you know, it's a big month, I think, in the uh, in the world. So there's a lot of things to kind of stay connected to. Uh, great point. Great just to point. stay educated about what's going on. So I encourage, I always tell people this, The Athletic, DNVR, Denver Post, The Gazette, just subscribe, guys. Support the things that keep you informed. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time, man. We really appreciate it. Um, anything you, you you have for the audience before we depart? I wanted to bring up one little bubble anecdote that I forgot to mention. That was like one of my, you, you asked about player interactions and I didn't think about it in the moment, but there was like this one time where I'm sitting there, um, sitting with, with Jeff Zilgin and Sam Amick and we're sitting there down the hallway from the players' practices and Jalen Brown walks by. And Sam gets up and he introduces himself to Jalen Brown and he tries to pitch an athletic story. He's like, hey, Jalen, like, I want to I want to know if you've read this story. And Jalen's like, nah, I haven't read it. Like, I'm not, you know, but he, Sam's like pushing. He's like, you really will. You'll, you'll really enjoy this. Please read it. Jalen's like, OK. Jeff Zilgit interjects and he's like, hey, Jalen, I just want to let you know, we just published a story on you at USA Today. I really think you'll enjoy it. Jalen Brown's looking at us like, who the hell are these guys trying to pitch all their stories? As he's walking away, I'm like, Jalen, uh, if you care about the Nuggets and Lakers, check out the Denver Post. And he's like, no. And like turns around and just keeps him moving. Like those are the type of like human interactions that you got there, which is why it was so much fun. I feel so, so fortunate uh, to have been a part of it. Um, and that would be, you know, that was just one of my, it was this very special time. And you really, I really felt lucky because it does feel like it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. I wonder what Jokic would say if I'm like, hey man, did you read my article? You'd really like it. Really good I, article. I actually it. saw, I saw Jokic <laughs> walking down the hallway the first day I got there and I like jogged up to him and I was like, Nicola, Nicola. And I gave him like a fist bump and he did one of those big eye things. He was like, oh, like you're here. <laughs> it's like horrifying. God like, damn it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. He was more shy. He, he's very polite, but like yeah, he sure. was probably like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Thanks so much everybody for tuning in. We're going to be back again all week and then don't forget friday the dnba show noon set your timer set your watch mark your calendars whatever it is we're going to be live on our youtube page we'll see everybody there